All right, uh, thanks for coming everybody. Um, I'm gonna try and stay with the theme of the previous talk and make this a little playful. Don't want it to be too serious. Uh, so what we are talking about today is CLDR as a service. And I'll get into exactly what that means in a minute. Um, this is me standing awkwardly in front of some Chinese characters. Um, it's actually a uh, poem from an inscription on the Temple of Confucius. So I just have to point that out to everybody. Um, feel free to email me at my work address if you have any questions about the talk. And that's my Twitter handle, though I don't use it that much. Oh, now I'm one of those people she talked about. <laughs> OK, so come on, advance. This is the abstract. It's the same abstract that's in the uh, materials throughout. I'm just going to kind of summarize it. Basically, what I've done is tried to create a proof of concept for the CLDR data as a web service. And the CLDR web service is being written in TypeScript. It runs on Node. Um, it's containerized in Docker. And the idea is that you can get the CLDR data that you want and not get the CLDR data that you don't want and can filter it down, can get just the loca output locales you want and everything, and it's all dynamically delivered. I will note that the part I was hoping to do about you being able to play around with it in your own browser is not going to happen because I couldn't find appropriate hosting with the... Uh, TLS, um, get it set up, and also uh, Docker Hub went down last night, which was very unfortunate. But I've got everything locally on my machine, so I will do a pretty good demo of it. Uh, OK, so let's get started. So in terms of agenda, I want to give some real basic background about CLDR and the motivations for this project. Then we're going to do a high-level proof of concept overview uh, for the proof of concept uh, service that I've developed. Then I'm going to take you on a little tour of the public API, and then some conclusions and lessons learned. So let's start with background. Um, first question that we need to answer is, what in the heck is CLDR? If you don't know it, then this is going to be a very confusing talk. Basically, CLDR is this huge repository of locale data that is used by a variety of companies to do their software internationalization and localization. Uh, if you think of any company that does software and internationalization and localization, they probably are using CLDR either directly or indirectly through ICU, which is a case I will cover in a minute. So what is actually in CLDR? Um, a lot of this is gleaned from the CLDR website. Basically, there are two kinds of data in CLDR. There's this core data, which has your list of locales and the list of default locales. So it lets you know that if you just see FR for French, that it's really uh, referring to FR dash capital FR. Um, and then you have lots of supplemental information about locales and locale elements, like information about languages, information about scripts, information about territories. That's all in this core module. And that core data is the same across locales. Um, the other kind of data you have is localized data or locale data, or if you prefer, data for localization. And it consists primarily of translated names and localized elements, things like separators, uh, names for months, uh, names for different languages. And then it has locale-specific 
uh, formatting and parsing patterns or rules in some cases that you kind of drop those elements into and that what, that's what give you the localized output. Well, we're not gonna go uh, deep into that. And the important thing here is there is separate uh, copies of that data for each locale that's supported. Okay, so why would you want to use CLDR? Well, first of all, it's based on standards, which is always a good thing because it supports interoperability. You can make sure that uh, you're doing things the correct way. Um, the standards it's based on are BCP 47, that's the locale or language tag standard, Unicode, of course, and the language description markup language, I think that's what LDML stands for, um, which is an XML format, which is the base format uh, for CLDR. There is also a CLDR JSON, which is derived from the LDML. Uh, which is what I use primarily for uh, this project, just because it's easier to parse. Um, it includes data for 375 different locales in the modern edition. CLDR comes in two editions. It comes in a modern and a full edition, and the difference between those is how many locales are supported. I got the number 375 by taking the available locales, looking at just the, the modern portion, and. So there's really 374 locales plus the root locale. Um, but that's pretty good, just in the modern edition. I didn't count how many there are in the full edition. The data that's in CLDR covers a really broad range of internationalization and localization needs. Things like number formatting, date formatting, uh, duration formatting, list formatting, unit formatting. And it's also got some kind of interesting random data in there, like things like GDP for countries, which languages are used in which countries, which scripts which languages use, things like that. Uh, number four reason is that it's vetted. It's, you have people who are going through and reviewing this and looking at it and making sure it's correct, and it actually passes through a four-stage process before it's like fully vetted. And if you want to know more about that, I recommend that you go see Stephen Loomis's talk uh, later today. He's really the CLDR guru and can explain a lot of things I cannot. I'm primarily a consumer, not a contributor. And then finally, the most important reason, it's free and open source. So it's all released under the Unicode license. So you're welcome to use it, welcome to reproduce it, things like that. Okay, so now here comes the tricky part is, how do you actually use CLDR? Well, there are three kind of four main ways you can use CLDR. The first and easiest and probably the best way is to use the International Components for Unicode Libraries or ICU. And you can do that either directly if you're operating in C, C++ or Java, or you can do it in an indirect fashion where you, if you're working in like a browser environment or a language that is not C or Java, then it can be built into the browser or built into the compiler or whatever that, and then you can access that data through a uh, wrapped API. Um, the second method is to define, build, and install CLDR data modules. This is used a lot on front-end web stuff. Uh, there, there is the data and the ICU library now in most browsers, but kind of like in the early days and for some uh, frameworks still, you actually load the data for each locale individually as part of your application. And, and that has some advantages that we'll get to in a minute. And then the third one is what I really want to talk about today, which is making configurable CLDR data available via a web service. So in the first one, you have CLDR into ICU, and then your OS browser, whatever, to your app. The second one, you have some kind of bundler that produces these uh, modules that you use. And in the third one, you have what I'm calling a generator, which creates modules just like the bundler does, but instead of putting them into a file or a, a code module that you load, it actually loads them into a database, and then there's a web service that sits on top of that and you call the web service to get the data into your app. Okay. 
Um, so let's look at some of the pros and cons of those three approaches. Um, this, the first one, using ICU, is really the default best approach you should use. And, and the reasons are is that the data is all there and it's always available. Um, you not only get CLDR, you get ICU, which handles all the implementation, so you don't have to do that. All the operations are at a very low level in the stack, so they're fast. And the algorithms are tried and tested, so you don't have to concern about whether they've been done correctly. Kind of the cons of the ICU approach are that the ICU footprint is significant. I think it's for the standard uh, install of ICU, it's between 8 and 10 megabytes, something like that. Uh, and there are things you can do to shrink that down and make it smaller, but most of that data is, this, most of that size is the CLDR data itself. Um, when you're working in an environment like a browser or something like that, you may have incomplete ICU support. Uh, so certain things have not been implemented yet, they're going through committees, and they will be implemented eventually, but you're going to pay the cost for all that being installed in there, even though it's not available yet. But that's just in the size of your browser, so it's not such a big thing. Um, this is one that was pointed out to me by someone at Salesforce, is that when you have these different browsers that are out there in the wild, they're going to have different installs of ICU and therefore different versions of CLDR. And so your expectations about what it's going to do may not always match what's really out there, and you end up having to support like an array of browsers. And then finally, when you use ICU in that kind of indirect method, you have to uh, find some way to expose that to like user land. So a lot of work is required to take the ICU uh, API, which was developed quite a while ago, and kind of modernize it and expose it to something like ECMAScript. And there's a lot of good work that's being done on that. Okay. Uh, the bundler approach. Uh, this is great for front-end stuff because you can, only, you can load just one locale at a time, the data from one locale, and that keeps it fairly light. You're not loading all the data. Um, it also allows you, when you're building your app and not just building ICU, you can do some build time configuration about what data is included in your module. And then because you're building it yourself, you can actually control the CLDR version. Uh, it's, part, it's in there in your app. It's not dependent on what browser they're using. Um, the cons is, at this point, there's kind of a lack of standardization about what these data modules should look like. Um, and it does add significant uh, bundle and build complexity in that if you're using something like Webpack, you have to do something to generate those data modules either before your build process and like save them to your repo or as part of your build process itself. And that's okay if you're doing like three or four locales, but when you're doing 32 or 64 or whatever, that can uh, put a lot of time into your build and a lot of complexity too to make sure that you've got it in the right place. Um, again, because you're just loading the data in, it's going to be higher level processing is, instead of low level processing. And there are some difficulties when you're using uh, something that does static data module loading, like, say, uh, TypeScript or, or Webpack or something like that, in that because you can't dynamically load those modules, you, if you just do in Webpack where you specify a variable, and when you're um, loading the data module for the locale, Webpack is going to load all the locales. And then uh, there are ways you can get around that by doing the kind of mapping where you map locales to Webpack import statements and uh, kind of wrap a function in a function. And then it kind of allows you to just dynamically through, the, um, through Webpack's dynamic bundle loading, loading load the data just that you need. Okay, I think I covered everything. Is there any questions at this point? Does everybody kind of have a sense of what CLDR is? And... All right. So um, let's get on to what I, what I am working on. And this came about very much as a frustration with the second uh, uh, approach that I just mentioned. And that was, it gave us a lot of complexity in our build and, and uh, 
made it much more difficult to load the locale data. And so the idea I had, and I proposed this to some of the people at Unicode and to see if anybody had ever done this before, and apparently no one has, um, is that's to have a dynamic data delivery via a web service. And the reason that's nice is because you can then have dynamic filtering and configuration of the data. And it's external to the build. So you don't have to incorporate the loading of that data into your build process. You just make a call, load the data in. And so you can basically load the data at runtime. And then unlike the module delivery, you can actually make it either monolingual or multilingual. You can load the locale data for multiple locales at once. So that kind of opens up the possibility of multilingual front-end apps, which is not really something that's done a lot now because of the data loading. Um, the cons are, of course, it requires a network call. Um, it's, again, high-level processing, and you're just getting the data. You're not getting those nice ICU algorithms or anything like that. So you've got to implement that and take care of that all yourself. Okay, so let's talk. What I wanted to do after I kind of had this idea was just kind of throw together a proof of concept and see what was and wasn't possible and what it kind of looked like coming out the other side. Uh, so what I did is I did something very simple in Node.js. Um, the actual service is written in TypeScript. I did that because then you can do type che checking on the schema uh, for the different data modules derived from CLDR. Uh, all the kind of HTTP stuff is handled by Express. The data is stored in MongoDB because you can very easily take the CLDR JSON data and put that into a document database like MongoDB. And then the whole thing's kind of wrapped together in a Docker Compose, I don't know if you call that a cluster, a couple of containers that work together in app. Okay, so in terms of the actual parts of it, there are several different services that correspond to different I guess you would call them areas of CLDR. And each service is built in exactly the same way. So it's not quite a microservice, but it's sort of like that. You have an interface which defines what the module is going to look like. So here's my number system module. Then you have a mongoose schema that defines the collection inside the database for that module. Uh, then you have a model that kind of brings those two together and provides your access methods. And then that model is used inside a data access object to call into the model with specific queries. Um, for the admin interface, which we'll go over in a minute, there are uh, data transfer objects, which are uh, used for updates, uh, posting, putting, patching, that kind of stuff. And then the DAO is actually uh, inside a service module which calls the, uh, the DAO with the DTOs to uh, perform specific actions. On top of that sits a controller, which basically translates the web request into a request that the service understands and also does some uh, business logic. And then there's a stack of middleware that does validation of the data transfer objects and also controls access to different endpoints. You've got your roots, which control, uh, which define your endpoints that you can hit on the service and also define the queue of middleware and controller that a request passes through. You've got the server that creates the request and the response objects. And then finally, you have a separate generator that uses the same interface from the top to generate modules from CLDR JSON and put them into the MongoDB database. Okay. Uh, in terms of endpoints, every service has two types of endpoints. There's the public API, which is all get requests. So it never messes with the data. And then there's a secured ad uh, admin API, which basically is a, a typical CRUD interface. Um, so there is a special uh, endpoint for getting the list of locales. You can see it's public core locales. And then for each of the modules that are defined, you have public, the module name, 
And then if, if you're getting a specific element in that module, you have the reference to it. Like, so if you said public numbers, Latin, it's going to get you all the, or L-A-T-N actually, it's going to get you all the number systems that are called Latin for whatever locales you specify. Okay. Um, the available services that have been implemented so far are, as I said, the core locales, number systems, currencies, language names and information, scripts, territories, variants, extensions, and then dynamically constructed locales where you can pass in any BCP47 tag and it kind of pulls from the other services and gives you the data you need for that locale. Uh, for authentication purposes, there is a user's endpoint that's just a CRUD endpoint. It doesn't have a public. Um, uh, and then you have your authentication endpoint as well. Uh, in terms of query parameters, this is all kind of set up as a, as a query API. So uh, everything you do to determine what data you get back is by passing query parameters. And most of them you pass a comma separated list which then gets parsed into an array. And you have locales. That's what determines the modules that are actually returned, which locales you return data for. Then you have these uh, tags, keys, codes, and systems arguments, which determines what content for each of those locales is returned. Then you have a filters uh, query parameter which determines which elements inside the uh, data module that re you return are returned. And it's much easier when I show you a, an example later. And then you have the page and the limit um, parameters which take a number which are just for pagination and the limit of how many records are returned. Okay, so like here's some basic examples of how it works. You would do a get to public numbers with the query parameter locales equals en, a, r, and zh, and that's going to return you the number systems for English, Arabic, and Chinese. Um, you can do it for currencies, and you can pass in the codes parameter, which is going to, starting from alphabetically through the list of locales, it's going to give you the information on US dollars and Japanese yen for all the locales as you go down through the whole series. Um, you can also achieve kind of the same thing you do with that tags parameter for a single uh, kind of data point by putting that reference, like you can see with the USD uh, after the slash on the endpoint. So that third one is going to give records for US dollars in Arabic, English, and Chinese. Uh, and then the fourth one is the dynamic locales uh, endpoint where I'm actually passing in locales for EN-US and FR-FR, which are not what are actually in CLDR, but then I pass the locales in uh, with English and French, and it goes and it finds the English and French versions of the data for those locales I've specified, if that makes sense. And then finally, um, with the public territories, there's lots of interesting but not terribly useful in terms of internationalization uh, data in CLDR about things like GDP, population, population literacy. And by specifying this filters uh, query parameter, I can limit it so just the GDP and the languages information is returned as opposed to the whole data module. And then I've shown how the pagination and limit works. Okay, with that, um, let's go to the public API tour. Let me make sure I've got this up and running. Okay, so to start this up locally, you basically create a Docker Compose file which uh, specifies the images you want to pull down locally on your machine. You need to have a Docker Hub account. You need to be connected. Um, and then you do a Docker Compose up. The service starts up. And the first time you use it, you have to do uh, some seeding of the database because it's going to bring up an empty database. And so there's a docker compose exec yarn seed command that you can run that will actually go and get all the CLDR data, break it down into even smaller modules than we have in CLDR, 
and put those in the database. But I'm not going to show that because it takes a long time because there's a lot of data to churn through. Uh, so I've got my CLDR service uh, up and running. I've got my Mongo up and running. And I'm trying to think. I need to uh, get out of that and go into my browser. OK, let me pump this up a little bit. So first of all, here is um, the, the service runs on port 3000. That can be configurable as well. Here is the public core locales endpoint. Every endpoint returns an object with a descriptor of what kind of data it is and then an array with all the different data modules. In this case, we're just taking the modern section of the available locales and returning it. So these are all the locales that are supported. Da, da, da. And then this is the public number systems. Make that run again. Okay, and so as you see, each module has its MongoDB ID up here. And then I put the tag of the locale for which uh, you're returning data and the identity, which is just copied straight out of CLDR. There's a flag here for what kind of module type you're working with. And then there's this main element, and inside the main element is where all the actual data is. And you can see we have the display name, the digits, and it pulls together data from a bunch of different areas in CLDR to kind of make a, a common number system module. So here's all your symbols, the patterns for the different uh, types of number formatting. And another thing I've done kind of in this example is to simplify the references to the individual uh, data elements down from what you find in CLDR JSON because CLDR JSON is derived from the LDML and you can tell. Um, it kind of looks like JSONized XML. Um, so this has kind of simplified that a little bit. Um, right, so right now we're looking at Afrikaans and we're looking at the Latin number system. I can do something like this and say I just want filters and I only want the symbols. And now instead of getting all the patterns too, I just get the symbols back. And I can even go further than that and say, well, you know, I really just want the percent sign. So then I can do symbols dot percent sign. And now I'm, oh, I spelled it wrong. Symbols dot, I don't have my glasses on. This is, let's do symbols dot decimal. Uh, where'd it go? All right, that's a bug. Um, the next thing we have is after the number sim systems um, in the CLDR, JSON, those are both packaged in the same module, the same NPM module. You have your numbers and then you have your currencies and you get like a list of currencies and that's the file that you load in. What I've done when I load it into the database is actually break it into a separate record for each currency and locale combination. So um, let me change the locales to just English here. And you can see here we're, we're in the English locale. Here's the Australian dollars, uh, the symbols, the fractions. And then you have this stuff pulled from CDL core, which is the territories in which that uh, currency is used or has been used in the past. Um, and then it keeps on going down. Then you have the Bosnian, Herzegovina, Dinar and so on and so on. Um, the next one to look at is languages and let's do on this one tags equals EH. So let's look at across different locales the Chinese language. Um, okay, so here we are in Afrikaans again. We have the Chinese display name. We have what language family it belongs to because that data is in CLDR. The plural rules for cardinal and ordinal are included. The plural range rules are included. Um, the different scripts that are used for Chinese. And then the different territories in which Chinese is spoken either as a secondary or a primary language. Um, for scripts, you have the same kind of thing. Uh, 
where uh, you have the script name, the display name, and then you have the script metadata from CDL core is included as, all, as well, and the list of languages that actually use that script. Um, going on to territories, you have the tag, of course, you have the display name, any alternate display names, the parent territories or the territories that enclose that territory, and the contained territories, any territories that are inside that territorial grouping. And then you have the languages that are spoken in that territory and the currencies that are used in that territory. Um, it's, this is not a really good example. Let's do this. Let's do tags equals um, Brazil. There we go. Uh, and so now you can see the different languages that are spoken and the percentages and whether they're official or not, things like that. Um, variants, very much the same thing. It's a much smaller data set, but there's an individual record for each variant and each locale combination. Um, I forgot to do extensions. Let me do that. Extensions. Uh, that's, this is just going alphabetically through the list now, but I can do things like this and put calendar. And now I'm going to get for each locale the display names for those extensions that are have the key of calendar. And then the final one is the locales, which I'm going to say tags equal, let's do EN US. Close it. Oh. I spelled it wrong again, didn't I? Um, let's do something similar. It's en-us.posix, right? Because it's a, it's a variant. No? All right, I've got that wrong. And the demo gods don't smile kindly on when you, when you do this kind of thing. Uh, let's do locales and tags equal ch han s, there we go. All right, so now I've specified the ch han s locale and I get um, the patterns for locale display names. I get the actual display name for each language and all that information that was in the language module is sucked into the dynamic locales module. I get all the scripts, I get the territories, and then because I've specified a script in the tags parameter that I passed in, I also get all the information about that particular script as well. Okay, so that's kind of a really fast public API tour. All of this is available. I'll give links at the end so you can download it and play with it on your own. But I won't spend any more time on that. And let's go back to the slides. Okay. Um, so, conclusions. Uh, I'm really ahead of time, aren't I? Um, so there are several things that were not done as part of this proof of concept because it really was just a proof of concept. Uh, for one thing, I've done minimal validation on the data transfer objects for the admin API. It's not going through every field in that data and making sure it's correct. It's mostly just validating the module framework with the tag, the identity, the module type, and that main element. Um, API tests still need to be done on this, of course. Um, the deployment workflow is TBD. Uh, I'm hoping that I can like push this to something like an Amazon Elastic Container Service and deploy it uh, on Amazon AWS. Um, and then I'm thinking I should probably add something like a public core services endpoint, which is kind of like an index that tells you what all the other endpoints are, what filters are available, things like that. Um, lessons learned. Pulling data from CLDR, JSON, is very slow. Um, especially when you're hitting a lot of it and you're hitting multiple areas of CLDR at the same time. By contrast, pulling data from MongoDB is very fast. Um, and so that's one advantage that I wasn't anticipating too much. In fact, when I originally started this out, I was just going to pull from the CLDR data files, but putting it in a database was so much faster. 
Um, the other thing is that a service lends itself to a more granular breakdown of the data. So instead of having a currency list, you have an individual record for each currency and locale combination. Um, the service kind of eliminates the concern over size limitations because it's all sitting in the cloud somewhere and you're just pulling down the little bits of it that you need. Um, the modules, which you've seen, I've just kind of thrown together as I thought, saw fit, um, need to be standardized so that the idea is that we could have multiple uh, front-end frameworks on multiple apps and you would just have an install method and you could just feed an array of that locale data into it and boom, you'd be ready to go. And then finally, I think the service should be centralized. There should be a CDL, CLDR service that, I don't know if Unicode owns it or somebody else owns it, so that everyone on the web can just hit that but you could always also make it on premise if you have things like, well, I don't want the 40 version of CLDR, I want the 39 version of CLDR. And you could create different Docker images for the different versions of CLDR, and then you could install like 39 on premise in your own uh, environment. Uh, next steps. For, this is version 0.1.0. .0. For 0 0.2.0, I want to handle the date stuff. And so in terms of the endpoints that will be uh, developed, there'll be a calendars endpoint, which will include both the Gregorian calendars and all the other calendars. And then I'm gonna break off the actual formatting patterns that are in the calendars and do them separately as the dates endpoint. So that will just be for the data for uh, the formatting patterns. So you kind of get the elements in calendar and the patterns in dates. Um, time is what I would like to call the relative uh, time formats that you get in date fields right now in CLDRJs. And then also broken off from the calendar will be intervals. Uh, so we have the formatting patterns for that. And then the time zone exemplar cities and the meta zone mappings. Um, for 3.0, I'm gonna do units, lists, and perhaps annotations, but annotations is really big. Uh, and I'm not quite sure how to break it up yet, whether, because it's just, if you break it up by each annotation, it's just gonna be like one field. You know, millions of records. Um, yeah, and then I'm just thinking of kind of working my way through the CLDR stack and adding stuff as it goes along. Um, so, as I said, this is just a proof of concept, and so there is some help wanted. Uh, development. I am not real familiar with open source uh, projects. I could really use some help getting that all set up and getting contributions. There's gonna be a maintenance load that's gonna have to be taken care of. I would love to get like Unicode sponsorship or something like that. That would be really great and that we could, um, you know, have a, a committee, a working group or something like that that would be responsible for the standardization and, and the development of the service. Uh, sponsorship, uh, like I said, standardization of the data modules, that's something that really needs to happen. And then hosting, because I don't wanna pay for this all out of my own pocket if everybody starts hitting it. Um, so yeah. Um, here are the links. Uh, there's a GitHub repo that has the actual code in it. Um, there's a Docker Hub repo that has the image published for CLDR service. And then there's this GitHub gist right here, which I will show you. Uh, I hate that thing. Come on. Let me get it. Which is just for the Docker compose file that defines the service. And so if you want to run this on your own machine, basically what you do is you install Docker desktop for Windows or Mac. You create a new folder, you put the content of this gist in a file called docker compose, and then you run docker compose up dash d, and then after that you need to go in and seed the database one time, but that only has to be done one time. That's what I got. Thank you very much. Um, if you have any questions, I would be happy to take those now. Okay, you.
No, I haven't done any of the aliasing yet for this proof of concept. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, the the thought I would think is is like on the front end framework you'd want to have some kind of low crowd resolution logic, um, but that needs to be in the service as well, right? And so that's another thing that needs to be added. So the 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 thing is though with the dynamic locales. Oh, I just realized I got my email up. Nobody needs to see that. Um, with the dynamic locales, you can actually define any valid uh, tag sequence. Uh, that's supported by BCP 47. It doesn't have to be in CLDR because it's just pulling the little bits together to create the record for that locale. The second one is the, uh, to reduce that mm -hmm. so you, uh, Can I ask for multiple keys? Yes. Yeah. Yep. So you just have that comma separated list um, and you would just list the fields you wanted like that and it would give you those. Yeah. Right, you have to have different versions. Yeah, so um, I was kind of torn about this. I sort of developed this just sort of as a fun thing to do. Um, but it has the ability to either be on-premise or centralized. And I think there's going to be a large amount of use cases where people just want standard CLDR, right? But then there's going to be the use cases, like you say, where people need to override, and that's what the admin API is for, because you can actually push your own modules. Like, like for example, in the list formatting in CLDR, you have the Oxford comma, right? If you're not an Oxford comma person, then you could potentially take that out. Yes? Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Come on. There you go. And these will be in the in the sheet too. Yes? Did you consider a I I did. Um, this was more for well, there's more people who know how to work with REST than GraphQL, right? Um, and in the environment I'm thinking of putting it in, it's all REST. So that's another, but I'm not an expert on GraphQL, so we could certainly write a GraphQL API and make it part of the same service, right? Uh, and just have the two different kinds of endpoints. Right. That's that's a great GraphQL use case, yeah. The one thing is um, you're going to be doing uh, post requests then, right? It, when you're defining up the tree, and I wanted in this initial version to have something that you could just get by get, um, right? And that's. I have mixed feelings about GraphQL, actually. I, I don't, REST has been around for a while. People know how to use it. It's kind of got a lower threshold of entry into using REST than I think there is GraphQL. But I'm completely open to doing something like that. This, like I said, just a proof of concept. Yeah. Right, and I just haven't added anything like that, so. Have you thought about um, the locale resolution? Is like the CLDR your parent locales? Yeah. Um, actually, in the locales module, it lists the parent locales and the likely subtext, too. Okay. And they also have a best fit matching. Which right. Is which is a more an algorithm than a data thing. So I haven't implemented that. That's something I looked into. Originally, I was going to put, make it so you could have multiple CLDR versions in the same database. But when you're breaking it down into those little modules, it's just going to get really huge. And the queries will get slow, things like that. 
So um, what I was thinking in terms of versioning is you do a different image for each uh, version of CLDR, and then you would modify on top of that image any customizations that you wanted to do. Shane. Yeah, uh, yeah this is a, a good talk, and I, I think this is, um, I, I, I like how you're approaching, the way you're, you're approaching this with, like, you know, um, with, with the database and, and with, 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 with the rest of queries, and I think that's, that's really cool. I, I was wondering what your thoughts were about who's the consumer of this. So I, uh. I've got the CLDR JSON, I can get all this JSON stuff, but I'm not actually, like, what I can display to users. Um, Right, it's just the data. What sits between the CLDR data and the user? So I actually developed this after I developed that I18N locale thing I talked about last time. And um, usually now, like, if you look at, like, Globalized JS or something like that, you define a module that's got the install on the first of it and then just, like, a dump of the CLDR data, right, and you just require that. Um, so that adds the, a huge amount of build complexity for us when we're doing 32 locales like that. So what I would love to be able to do is to have my IATN locale framework just make that call for the particular locale it wants and then, uh, you know, whatever, and it could be any front-end framework, it just installs the data like that and then you use it. Does that answer your question? So are, are you saying the, the decline of globalized JS? It could be globalized JS, it could be this framework that I've written. I, I think there's a lot of cases too where you could do it at build time, right? If, you know, as part of your build process, you reach out to the CLDR service and do the same kind of module thing as you do in part two, but just doing it with the service rather than having to save it to your repo or something like that. But you're right, this, this needs algorithms around it, right? It's just data at this point. Oh, great. So I think you kind of answered the question I had, which is when you're publishing to the App Store, for uh -huh. instance, um, they don't like it when you're doing too much, when you're doing dynamic loads of information that they can't use. Yeah. So I think your idea during the build time for the specific App Store. So that yeah. I mean, I mean with, with any App Store you're going to have right now, that data is already there, right? So it's not really a, a huge use case for this. I'm thinking this mostly front-end web because that's what I do, but I also think part of my inspiration for doing this was I was teaching a course at uh, Middlebury Institute of International Studies on data-driven localization, and I was trying to explain to the students what the different types of localization data are. You know, you have your strategic data that helps you find out where you should go. You have your operational data that comes from your TMS, lets you know what kind of cost you have. And then you have this data that's actually used for localization. And I, I, in part, built this service so then I can take my students and say, hey, just pull the data from here and you can kind of explore. And that's where things like GDP and literacy uh, percents, which aren't really that useful in internationalization or localization, could still be accessed through this for perhaps non-internationalization and localization purposes. Um, yes, yeah, so the main improvement is just uh, having the build time complexity, I think, was the big thing for us. Um, uh, to, to just be able to have that all sitting off somewhere where I can get just the data I want and pull it in at build time or run time or whatever makes my job as a internationalization framework developer easier. You know, in that I don't have to worry, if we can standardize what the data modules look like, then I don't have to worry about the CLDR data. I can develop my framework knowing that there's a standard API that I'm gonna hit and I can bring it in and that way you could, you could potentially develop something like ICU for X for multiple platforms that all load the same standardized set of data. That, I, I don't, that's not really a good answer to your question, but. I just feel that 
this approach is going to need a little bit of algorithms to like, right. the data and actually get what you just need. Not right. Yeah. Yeah, and there is there's some business logic in the controller layer, but a lot more needs to be added. So uh, we're about out of time. So Razor, you can ask a question afterwards. But uh, a couple of housekeeping things. One is please uh, give your impressions, evaluation at online unicodeconference.org slash eval dash st for speaker e v a l dash SP for the evaluation. And thank you very much, Joel.